So, welcome to Garden Cottage, um, the oldest intentional food forest garden in Britain. Um, this has been made because we were interested in permaculture and permaculture offers uh, the, the guidance that um, really you want to start with your own life if you want to change the world and, and how you live and what you do. Um, when I was at school we were taught about maths, physics, chemistry, biology. Physics, chemistry, biology is the three sciences and there was always a sense somehow that uh, physics about the properties of the universe, chemistry about how, what it's made of, that somehow these were more important than biology. But the fact of the matter is that biology gives you lessons that go the opposite way to lessons from physics and chemistry because what biology tells you is you can't stop life. Um, if you look at the ground here, this um, paving is made of basalt, um, a black rock. It's incredibly hard. It's one of the most inert substances on the planet Earth and a huge amount of the Earth's crust is made of basalt. It's a, a volcanic rock. But if you come with me, just walk this way. Um, what you see is that at the edge of this hard standing, there's grass, there's dandelions, there's weeds. They're starting to encroach. Uh, you can see places where mosses are building up. So down here, for example, this is the start of soil. So even on bare rock, you start to get plants growing. Um, there's some little uh, pimpernels and stuff coming here, various weeds. So the question I, I generally ask people is, if you took um, all the sheep and all the people out of Scotland, what would you end up with? Um, and the answer is forest. Um, forest is an interesting word because we tend to think of forests as being trees and this forest garden has got lots of trees in as you'll see but it doesn't mean trees it comes from the Norman French forest modern French forêt which means the king's hunting ground so before we did agriculture we were hunter-gatherers and it's really a legacy of that and in a way permaculture is about going back to being hunter-gatherers as much as possible. Um, come and have a look. So this garden was started 26 years ago it was bare ground, well, not bare, but flat ground, with some weeds growing on it. it. Garden Cottage was built as a retirement home for the gilly on the Lees estate, which this is part of originally, um, when he retired in 1948. And he lived here free for the rest of his life, and he, Mr. Taylor was 97 when he died, so he had a good long innings. But because he was getting elderly, they stopped gardening. So everything that you see here has happened in the last 26 years. Um, and if we're using the forest as a model, because permaculture is about observing and learning from nature, then the first thing that you'll notice is there are things happening at every different level of the forest. We originally learnt about this from um, a guy called Robert Hart, who lived in Shropshire uh, in his retirement. And Robert Hart had learnt a great deal from, deal from being in India with the great Scottish plant collector um, Sholto Douglas. And he noticed that, in particular in Kerala province, it's very normal for a family to be able to feed itself from a garden as small as this. This is 800 square metres. That's 0 0.08 of a hectare, or a fifth of an acre. 
typically gardens in Kerala province might be a quarter of an acre. They've got some things easier in life because it's tropical, subtropical, so they get three harvests a year. Here we get one main harvest which is between June and October and we get things that you can harvest the rest of the year, some brassicas, some salads and so on. But the bulk of what we grow here happens in that four month period, mid-summer to the autumn. And what Robert noticed is that the forest has, as he put it, seven layers. Climax trees, understory trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, ground cover plants, things that are mostly root, so bulbs, onions and so on for example, uh, climbers, so in a, a typical British forest we would say um, blackberries for example, or honeysuckle, and um, <clears throat> there's a further layer which is much more common in tropical rainforest than it is in a temperate climate called epiphytes. Epiphytes are plants that grow up off the ground on trees. So you might have seen air plants in people's sitting rooms. That's an example. Um, much more common here are things like ferns, mosses, lichens and so on growing up off the ground. We would also add today fungi as a layer in themselves because they're immensely important to how life flourishes in the garden. And I'm actually not certain we're done then because I look at the garden and I see bees pollinating things and I wonder, well, are the bees, and there's a wasp actually over there doing just that job at the moment as well, are, are, are the insects in the garden also a part of its layer? And one of the things you'll notice here all year round is constant bird song. Um, there are 35 species of bird that nest in this garden. There are 20 that come for their lunch and there's another 20 that come on their holidays. So there's incredible variety of life, both of invertebrates and, and songbirds here. And that is crucial to why the system works. Just a little further into the garden. You can see areas where it's pretty much left wild. Um, these stitchworts, which are naturally a hedgerow plant, do have any particular uses for people? Not that I know of. Um, called stitchwort because it looks like the stitching around a buttonhole. Um, these euphorbias, uh, one of the largest plant family, common name spurge, um, <clears throat> not a lot of uses for humans. In fact, the sap is toxic to humans, and if I break a piece off, you'll see you get a, a milky white fluid from it. And this actually burns the skin. So it does have a use, because you can use them to remove warts. But that's not why they're here. Um, they're here because all of these things help um, keep insects and birds in place. So what the permaculture message is, really, is if we want to be sustainable inhabitants of the planet Earth, um, then we need to work less hard and produce less waste. And we talk a lot in the present era about pollution, for example. Um, all pollution is, is assets that are in the wrong place. Something's only a pollutant because we're not reusing it. So what we're trying to do as much as possible in designing a permaculture system is to provide everything we need from the, for the system from within itself and to use everything it produces within itself. So an easy example would be to say, well, composting. If we compost the waste from the garden, that helps build soil and we can reuse it. But you can keep adding things in to the cycle of energy usage. So, for example, if you feed your plant waste to your chickens, then you get chickens and eggs as well as the compost because you still get the compost because it comes out the other end of the chicken. And what you're always trying to find is how can I build more yield into the system? So one of the messages here is that true yield is unlimited. You can never get everything that you could out of a system. You can still go to the Amazon rainforest 
and build more tree houses, find more plants that you can grow there. The same here, there's a constant polyculture of huge range of plants. Um, and just to give you uh, some little examples, um, strawberries here, naturally growing on the forest edge. Um, <clears throat> gooseberries, trained as standards. Um, this bush will produce four kilos of fruit this year. Uh, it's just coming to the end of flowering at the moment and you can just start to see the small fruits forming where the flowers have been. Um, <clears throat> but because it's a standard, it's much easier to pick the fruit. It's got sharp spines on it, so it's much easier not to prick yourself when you're picking the fruit. Um, because it's up in the air, it doesn't get mildew. And you can use the ground underneath to grow other stuff. Now, a lot of this stuff, if you're not used to it, probably just looks like weeds. And that's exactly what a lot of it is. But every food plant we had was originally a weed. So if we just look here, for example, um, we've got um, wild garlic. Um, I've just made <coughs> 20 jars of <coughs> wild garlic pesto over the weekend. This one's uh, a particular allium called Allium triquestrum. It has a three-cornered stem, also known as three-cornered leek. Um, there's ground elder, very invasive weed, but it was actually a gift from the Romans who brought it in as a vegetable. You can use it in salad and spinach. Primroses, the flowers of primroses are edible. Very nice way of brightening up a salad. Over there is garlic mustard. Fantastic burst of flavour in the mouth. Um, we have uh, this plant with the red veins in the leaves here. This is called Ruby Sorrel. Rubex sanguinea. Very nice in a salad. Doesn't have a very strong taste, but you get these lovely red leaves in the salad. Over behind here, Lungwort. Um, we use the flowers in salads. Traditionally, it's a pulmonary. Um, in fact, that's its name, Pulmonaria officinalis in botanical terms. And that's used, was used to treat lung conditions. We're constantly learning about the plants here and um, constantly finding new things that you can do with them. Uh, but there's over 100 fruit trees in this garden, nut trees. This is uh, an apple called Pitmaston Pineapple, originally from Devon. Um, this is part of our nursery stock. These are trees for sale for people. There's red currants coming there. Willow here. Budlier, often called butterfly bush here. This is a plum just coming into flower. Well, this is a medlar. Um, Mespulus germanica. Not many people grow medlars these days, but a very nice, slightly astringent fruit. Uh, very popular with Elizabethans. Um, and I sometimes think that we're actually a second lot of the Elizabethans and will people later on call us that. Um, a lot of Scottish varieties here. This cultivar is called Tower of Glams. Um, and the one uh, just here is White Melrose. Um, this was originally came from the monks, Cistercian monks at Melrose Abbey where Robert the Bruce's heart is buried. Um, these logs are growing shiitake mushrooms. Um, we've already had some this year, but uh, these five logs here last season produced three kilos of shiitake mushrooms. I've just planted four more. Um, it's quite a neat way of growing your own mushrooms. <clears throat> this is a quince tree here. <coughs> That'll be coming to blossom soon. Uh, this is an apple tree called Blenheim Orange. Um, that one tree produced 
80 kilos of apples last year. And then there are flowers, just because we like flowers. Over here is Magnolia stellata, just over the pond. Uh, we don't have any special uses for it except to admire it. Um, these white flowers down here are ramsons, another kind of wild garlic. Um, nettles allowed to grow in the garden because nettles are very important food for many of our butterfly and moth species and they're growing in a bed of um, solidago or goldenrod as it's often called um, which is very important because it flowers very late in the summer so it's great for bee fodder for the end of the season you've got to think about what do the insects need to eat and if you are here this time of year and sit and watch you'll notice that the blue tits in particular but some of the other small songbirds spend lots of time going along the branches of the trees nibbling away and what they're doing is they're eating aphids so I suggest if you don't have aphids in your garden you've got a problem because what are these guys going to eat what you want is all these things in balance and that's the importance of having all these species so I think what we've primarily learned from the garden is if you create the right habitat the right things happen and that's true not just of plants but of people as well if we make the right habitat the right things happen for everybody field beans um, This is a fantastic plant, it's just a wild native plant. This is Sweet Sicily. Um, and mm, it's got the most delightful aniseed taste. Um, if you wait till it's got its green seeds on, it's like sweeties. And my five-year-old grandson here was on was here at, at the weekend. And he said, hmm, it's just like sweeties. And he sat and ate a whole plateful of Sweet Sicily, quite happily probably wouldn't eat a plate full of salad but that's what it is potatoes grown in tire towers we also grow horseradish this way the little bottle hanging in the tree is um, it's a hotel for lace wings so in the autumn the lace wings can lay eggs inside the corrugated cardboard um, again just a good bit of habitat and there's something else that likes to eat aphids and they're very pretty insects as well <clears throat> leeks with tulips and strawberries growing amongst them more leeks here pansies growing pansies are also edible nice in a salad um, these are various brassicas growing under the fleeces here that's to keep off pigeons and pheasants which can be quite destructive of young brassicas cabbage family plants. This is a whole different range of onion family plants. Shallots and garlic. Um, some early espaliered apple trees. These are quite young still. Um, this one at the back is called Scotch Dumpling. Got a very nice pink blossom on it. Autumn raspberries. Lots more food plants just for the insects. Um, and we even create our own climate. Um, this greenhouse, <coughs> designed by me uh, 20 something years ago, South facing on the glass side, north facing on the shed side. This is a tool shed and workshop. Um, we can bring young plants on here over the winter. <coughs> so um, down here we've got parsnips and carrots being grown in toilet roll liners. They'll be planted out as they are. But what that does is it gives you a month's advantage by bringing them on indoors. You've got some beans there waiting to be planted out. And the guttering here is growing peas 
The advantage of this technique is <clears throat> there's lots of mice around here and mice love to take beans and peas but they don't if you put them out as plants they only take the seeds so if you start them off in a guttering like this you make a trench and you empty it into the trench again your peas get a start and they're far less likely to get eaten. Um, various other seedlings here there's globe artichokes over there um, there's various things coming on in the bed here uh, which will get thinned out and planted out soon. Um, we've just planted the first tomatoes in here which we started off under glass and lettuces. Um, this is an experiment um, and we're always experimenting as is anybody who grows anything you're always experimenting and what you've got here is three grafted tomatoes and three tomatoes of the same variety grown from seed and it's a test to see which do better. Um, you pay, obviously you pay a lot more for grafted tomatoes than you do just to buy a packet of seed but um, it is generally said that they are prolific in the way they fruit and they fruit earlier so it's to test that theory. Um, passion fruit overhead this passion fruit is um, two years old and it sorry three years old this is and it fruited for the first time last year this is um, Passiflora cerulea as opposed to Passiflora edulis which is the black passion fruit you get in fruit shops here in the UK the Australians call this banana passion fruit um, originally from Central America and there are a number of grapevines in here some of these are for sale but some of them are planted the one at the far end over the doorway there is three years old and last year that had 200 bunches of grapes on it in an unheated greenhouse the same latitude as Alaska not bad <laughs> sorry sorry Lee. <laughs> don't run away <laughs> um, <laughs> young peas this is a variety called Gladstone which you can't buy anymore um, so it's a project to preserve the seed variety uh, which is why we're particularly growing them in the greenhouse here so we just keep growing these on and we harvest some every year but we keep a lot to, so we can keep producing the seed but here we are this is um, early May and we've already got peas There are so many productive species and varieties, thousands of them, that um, you can create a polyculture like this very easily, but not instantly. It takes time, it's incremental, and, and good solutions don't happen overnight. It's one of the things that you have to be with permaculture is patient. The yield records for this garden if you extrapolate them are about 14 tonnes a hectare. That's more than the farmer gets next door on his huge fields with his John Deere tractors and his 14 furrow plough and it's just done by hand on a couple of days a week work. These are all soft roots for sale. <coughs> Solar panels and even the solar panels collect rainwater into water butts. So everything is put to as many uses as possible. Another principle of permaculture. <clears throat> Young planting here, carrots, parsnips and leeks interplanted, garlic behind. This is a beautiful angelica just coming into flower. Naturally a seashore plant, nice in salads. And Angelica and Sweet Sicily, you can cook with rhubarb and you don't need sugar because they break down the oxalic acid in the rhubarb and stop it being bitter. Field beans, some tail end of some brassicas, some rainbow chard, um, rhubarb artichokes here. Lots of green manures in the garden. This is Russian comfrey. You just keep cutting it to feed the soil. And this is the problem with the garden. I can only ever show you half of it. 
because the most important half is actually under our feet and I can't show you that. It's the living soil is what makes this garden work. So what we spent 26 years doing is building this soil. There'll be two tons of earthworms in this garden. You might have heard of willing workers on organic farms. Um, well, these are the best ones you can get. Two tons of earthworms is, um, that would fill a couple of those dumpy bags that aggregates are delivered in by trucks from builders merchants. Each of those weighs about a ton. Two tons of earthworms is the same as 20 men weighing 100 kilos each. 100 kilos is a fit, strong man. So we tried not to dig the garden. Um, sometimes you have to a bit, but digging eventually destroys the soil structure. So what we're doing here is we're just creating habitat in which earthworms love to be and they dig the soil for us. And unlike volunteers, you don't have to feed them. They don't mess up your bathroom and the living room. They don't stop on Saturdays or Sundays. They start whenever they want and they stop whenever they want. But they don't go on holiday. They slow down in the winter a bit. And they're free. Why would you not want earthworms? Well, if you don't want earthworms, spray chemicals on your land. It kills them. Fennel, garlic. Ponds. Uh, useful for wildlife and ducks. We don't have any ducks at the moment. Bit of a duck disaster last year. Combination of weasels and buzzards. And we're going to be going away at some point this year, so we'll restock the ducks when we come back from that. Fabulous pear tree here. This is from the Isle of Wight. It's called Deacons. Uh, produces very reliably every year beautiful red pears. Um, we have um, we make about 15 cubic meters of compost a year and um, and then we grow squashes in them. This is a pumpkin. Um, we've just had to take the uh, cloche off it this morning because it's got too hot with the sun today um, so it's looking a bit limp. So generally speaking we try not to water them. Um, that will need a bit of a drink. Um, this hoarded horseradish growing in tar towns. Marrows growing under cloches. Um, curly kale, sorry, rugged jack kale, this one. Perennial salads here, lots of interesting things. Leaf celery, chives, more ruby sorrel. Siberian purslane, or Russian purslane it's sometimes called. Um, Native in the Scottish Highlands, well, sorry, it's naturalised in the Scottish Highlands. Land crests behind, salad burnet. Just food everywhere you look. Um, <clears throat> we saw some peas in the greenhouse earlier. This is similarly first planting of earlier product. And we'll be putting some more bean towers in there for runner beans. Rhubarb. Um, just coming nicely in the spring. And the, the black um, bins are to force it, so it brings it on earlier by growing it in the dark. <coughs> back at the dining room with the caterers.